Well, good day. This is our Dryden Family Quizzing talk number three. We're focusing on Matthew 3, and we'll just dive right into this passage. There's really two main sections to the passage, where you have the explanation and the preaching of John the Baptist, and then we have the baptizing of John the Baptist, where he baptizes Jesus. I've kind of summarized Matthew 3 with one quick sentence. John the baptizer does some baptizing and preaching. And of course, we see this as it plays out. This section really has four main sections in chapter 3. Verses 1 to 4, we focus on John the Baptist preaching and who he is. Our second part in verse 5 to 10, two types of people come to John the Baptist. And 11 to 12, uh, one greater than John will come, and of course that is Jesus. And verses 13 to 17, Jesus is baptized. So let's look at John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes preaching, and note the content of what he's saying. He doesn't water down his message. He doesn't say all these fluffy things that people try and persuade you with with soft words to persuade you about Christianity and following the Lord Jesus. He doesn't make the message easier for people. He clearly says his first words, repent. And as we were talking about last night in quizzing, repent is the first word that John the Baptist says. It's the first word that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4 when he preaches. It's what the apostles preach uh, when they're sent out. It's the first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent. And it is in Paul's message, he preaches repentance. And of course, it said repentance out of the seven churches, five out of the seven churches in Revelation are called to repent. This word means to do a 180 degree turn. Let's just imagine I'm on the pathway to sin. I'm headed towards sin, away from God, and I'm heading right towards sin. I do this 180 degree turn. I say no to sin and I head towards God. I head towards God. That is the very definition of repentance. It means that you have a hatred. It means you have a sorrow or a sadness for sin and you make it diligent and you make it your life goal not to partake in sin anymore. Why do we need to repent? It says it right here. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is the idea that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is actually here. In Matthew 3, verse 3, we have Matthew writing that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verse 3. John the Baptist is a preparer for Jesus Christ. He has a preparation ministry, a, a, a preparation in the sense that he's calling people to turn back to God and make their way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the coming of John the Baptist is a fulfillment and shows that Isaiah 40 verse 3 is tied to him. In 3 verse 4, we now hear about the clothing of John the Baptist and the diet. And you might be thinking, who actually cares what John the Baptist ate, what he wore? And he, what does it say about him? It's uh, that he, has, he eats locusts and wild honey. But this actually goes back to the prophet Elijah. It's similar attire to Elijah. And the fact that Matthew is attributing to clothing of John the Baptist to that of Elijah reveals that John the Baptist in and of himself is a mighty prophet from God. So we have this introduction, his message, his clothing, his, his food. Next, there's two types of people that come to John the Baptist. In verse 5 to 6, five to six of chapter 3, people come from Jerusalem, people come from Judea in the region of the Jordan, and these people come confessing their sins. This is an admission that what you have done is wrong. It's an acknowledgement that your thoughts, actions, and attitudes are sin in the eyes of God. But another group comes in verse 7 to 10 that catches the attention of John the Baptist. Two people, Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees were very strict religious Jews who took the law of God not only very literally but very strict 
and they would make laws so that you would not violate the laws. The Sadducees are described in the New Testament as people who denied the bodily resurrection and who denied angels, and they're Jews as well. John calls them actually a brood of vipers, which is by no means any sort of compliment. And he calls them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He says, if you're coming to repent, actually truly repent. Don't just give it lip service. Don't give repentance any sort of lip service or give a fake repentance. Show uh, true repentance by actually turning from your sin, hating sin. And in 3 verse 10, John warns them of the coming judgment, that it will be one where the axe chops the tree down and it will be burned with fire. And this kind of is very similar to what we used to do in the peach orchard when I lived in southern Ontario. When a tree did not bear fruit, we just didn't keep fertilizing the tree and caring for the tree. We chopped that sucker down, we cut, chopped it down, and we burnt that tree. And that's what Jesus will do with those who truly do not repent. You will experience God's judgment for your sin. Let's look at our third point in chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. One greater than John will come. In John 3, 11, John describes his baptism for repentance, but one more powerful who comes after him will come. And John is not even worthy to carry his sandals. And if you remember that the God, in the Gospel of John, it talks about this as well, that uh, John the Baptist is not worthy to untie the sandals of the Lord Jesus. Remember, anything to doing with feet, shoes, cleaning of the feet, was only something that was done by non-Jewish servants. It was the lowest of the low, the thing that you had to do. It would be like worse than cleaning someone's toilet after they made a mess of the toilet going to the bathroom. It's the lowest of the low. But John the Baptist isn't even worthy to do the lowest of servant things for this Messiah, this Jesus. But Jesus will come and he will baptize with two things. The Holy Spirit, which we see fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, and as well with fire. And of course, this refers to the fire of judgment, which... Uh, John previously talked about in uh, 3.10 of Matthew. Finally, we have Jesus being baptized. Now there's something important we need to know about the baptism of Jesus. Jesus comes up out of the water, meaning that he was actually submerged into the water, meaning that he was actually biblically baptized. The word baptizo or baptiptos or baptiztos, Greek words, mean to submerge or to dip or some translations even to wash which and when you wash something you submerge it and so jesus went down into the water went under the water was from a biblical perspective baptized and raised up out of the water came up out of the water during the baptism we see the holy trinity jesus is being baptized by john the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus like a dove, and we have this voice that says, This is my Son, whom I am well pleased. And here we have the voice of the Father. Here we have, in one event in the New Testament, in the baptism of Jesus, we see the three distinct persons of the Godhead. God the Father speaking, God the Son being baptized, and God the Holy Spirit coming upon the Lord Jesus. We also see something that the Father says about Jesus. My Son. The Father loves the Son. The Father is well pleased with His Son, the Lord Jesus. And it's the same thing that God says at the Transfiguration when Jesus is up on the mountain in Matthew 17, verse 5. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. The one thing we need to apply this to our heart, just one of the things, because there's many we could apply, is that we need to teach Christianity properly. Because in the past, we've the church has taught easy believism. And here we see that if we are going to follow Jesus, we truly do need to repent. We truly do need to be a people who bear fruits with repentance. And so today, I just ask you to examine your life, if you're a believer. Have you truly 
bore fruits of repentance to the glory of the Lord. I pray that we all have. Amen.